Nice to see you. Hope you're doing well. Got up last Thursday morning and actually got my suit on, went to the office, got the notes ready. And somehow between that time and by the time I got home, I couldn't even walk. So I was on my bed for three and a half days. Um, and this happens every once in a while. This is my, everyone has a thorn in the flesh, right? This is my thorn in the flesh. Um, Usually it's because I've done something manly, like dug a tree out by the roots, or, you know, once I was digging a chicken coop with a pickaxe, you know, and that kind of stuff. But this time I can't brag about anything. I mean, I literally <laughs> don't know what it was. Uh, so I told my wife, I said, Shelly, you got to just pinch it for me, you know. Uh, I've already sent the notes out. And she, bless her heart, she did, and she just jumped in, and she had about an hour to prepare. And she told you last week, she said, you know, I asked her to do that once before. It wasn't because of a jazz game, okay? <laughs> it was BYU and Jimmer Fredette in the Sweet 16, okay? <laughs> um, but she tried to use my notes, and it went off not, not so well. So she just kind of said, I'm not doing that. I'm going to teach whatever's in my heart. Uh, and because of that, I think there will be virtually no overlap between what she said last week and what I plan to say today. Um, I'm excited about this topic, uh, the signs of the times. We've really only got one class left after this where we'll do the millennium. Um, and, uh, but, you know, a lot of, anyway, in, in my preparation this week, I've just been all over the place in the scriptures, and I have no idea where we're going to go today. It's a, this is going to be really fun. Um, but there, it's so rich this doctrine, and so applicable. Uh, we do live in the last days. And um, the Lord made it known that he would uh, help the elect and his covenant sons and daughters uh, to be able to read the signs of the times. And uh, that, that ought to be a great comfort to us. These are not things, uh, his, his coming should not be a shock, a surprise, um, of course, no man knoweth the exact hour, uh, but the Lord has given us a great deal if we will search in the revelations to discover uh, what we might anticipate uh, prior to his second coming. And so we'll, we'll look through some Doctrine and Covenants passages. We'll, we'll, we'll read, you know, the Lord himself in Joseph Smith Matthew, which is Luke 24, and, um, or, or, or Matthew 24, rather, uh, Joseph Smith's rendition of that. We'll We'll look at some, uh, some of the uh, revelation of John and uh, hopefully distill some, some occurrences and some principles relative to these, these, these signs of the times. Now, a, a few things that we could just say. Um, you know, President Harold B. Lee uh, wrote that when we're trying to anticipate and decipher the signs of the times, that we should, you know, put more reliance on the living prophets and the scriptures than on whatever, you know recent book has come out, whatever uh, some guru is saying about this sort of thing, calculating the, the days and the minutes. Um, well, that, that makes good sense. Uh, I, won't, I won't read that quote. You have it before you. But I do think one thing that ought to give us some comfort is this third page that I showed you here. If you just want to look, I won't even know if my scriptures could have got it here. The 106th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. This is one of the keys to interpreting the signs of the times. Um... And again, verily I say unto you, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and it overtaketh the world as a thief in the night. Therefore gird up your loins, that you may be the children of light. And that day shall not overtake you as a thief. So the Lord's counsel, so that you're not caught sort of unawares, is to be a covenant son and daughter. Gird up your loins. You keep the covenant of your election, and the elect are those, says the 29th section, that do not harden their hearts, that open their ears. Uh, you do that, and you'll be protected, you'll be aware, uh, you'll be on the right side of the events that are uh, coming, and that are frankly, in many cases, dreadful. Uh, but here he's to say that, look, um, you as the children of the covenant, the children of light, will not be overtaken. 
Well, that's, that's comforting, and frankly, that's maybe where we begin, is in Joseph Smith Matthew, because that's precisely what the Lord was saying to the Meridian Day Apostles. Um, he was giving them signs because they were of the covenant. And so let's, let's begin this story. In the last week of the Savior's life, as you know, he came down from the Galilee and spent a week prior to his atonement uh, in and around the city of Jerusalem. We have the account, obviously, of Palm Sunday and the great triumphal entry. Uh, we have him teaching on the Temple Mount the majority of Monday and Tuesday. Uh, we don't have in the scriptures what happens on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, it's the Passover feast and Thursday night and then the atonement into Friday. Well, on Tuesday of that week, he's teaching on the Temple Mount. He's with his apostles. And then he has been retreating at the end of each day to go back to Bethany, where he's been staying with Mary and Martha, his dear friends, and lodging there. Uh, and as he goes back, uh, on, on this one occasion, he's up on the, the crest. This is towards the east of Jerusalem. And he's cresting those mountains where he sees the city before him. And he sits down and he is melancholy because he has perfect Syriac vision where he can see what will transpire to this beautiful city, the golden city, the triumphant city. And he understands the great pains that will come uh, upon the Jews. Now, we've already had Assyria in 721, you know, come and capture Jerusalem. We've already had Babylon in 587 B.C. come. And this is when Lehi departs, right? This place has seen wave after wave after wave of conquerors. Uh, it's the crossroads of the Mediterranean. Uh, and, and because of that, empires were frequently very, oh well, they, they, they wanted that place. It was a key strategic military, you know, passageway to connect sort of northern and southern Mesopotamia. So here Christ is, he's looking out, and um, his apostles come to him. Uh, well, let me back up. He looks out and he sees in Syriac vision what will happen to Jerusalem in 70 AD. And you know well that that's the time that the Romans come to destroy Jerusalem. Um, and that they literally leave the temple in shambles. They take the stones and throw them and cast them over uh, the side of the great retaining wall that we now call the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. One, I've been to Israel many times. I've led groups over there. On, you have been there with me. Um, one of the most impressive uh, things to see in my calculation is if you're standing on the south side uh, of the walls of, of the Temple Mount, uh, on the south and on the west, you can see these massive stones that have been hurled off the side of the wall. And it's probably, I don't know, probably 80 to 100 feet that they had fallen. And these are stones that are as big as one of these church pews. And um, that was the Romans taking apart that temple. And literally, I mean, that's real venom to go that far, to take that edifice down and to destroy it and scatter it. Because symbolically, you're destroying and scattering the heart and the mind of the people, the very center of their worship and their focus, right? And so Christ sees this, and then he sees much more. Um, Josephus tells us that there were probably about a million Jews who were killed uh, in the days that would come. You know, can you imagine? Uh, and this is just a horrific time, and it saddens the Savior a great deal. Um, well, the, Jew, uh, the apostles that day, he, the, the Lord made some reference to this on the Temple Mount, the Tuesday before he was to, to be killed. And um, we pick up the story here. You come with me. We'll be in the scriptures almost entirely today. Uh, Joseph Smith Matthew. We read it here instead of uh, in Matthew 24 because... Much like the experience with Enoch in the Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith just 
inserts a tremendous amount uh, of additional revelation here. It's not a comma. It's not a couple of words. In fact, I've got a word count. The word count in Matthew 24 is 1,047 words. Joseph Smith Matthew word count is 1,531. Okay, so he adds about 50% more in this revelation than what we would have in the New Testament. Now, I, we won't take the time to read much of the preamble here, other than to maybe begin here in verse 2, and you see that Jesus goes out and departs from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to hear him, saying, Master, show us concerning the buildings of the temple, as thou hast said. They shall be thrown down and left unto you desolate. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things, and do ye not understand them? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here upon this temple one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. All right. And then Jesus left them and went upon the Mount of Olives. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when these things which thou hast said concerning the destruction of the temple and the Jews. That's the first question. And now the second question. And what is the sign of thy coming and the end of the world, or the destruction of the wicked? which is the end of the world. There are two questions that are posed. The first one has to do with this, uh, this destruction of the temple. And the second one has to do about, well, when are you going to come again, and when is the end of the world? What follows is the Lord's answer to both of these questions. Uh, question one is answered from verses 5 through half of 21. Then the remainder, the second half of verse 21 through the end of the chapter, deal with the second question, what you and I would call the signs of the times. All right? One thing that the Lord does is he makes it clear that uh, the temple is symbolic of the house of Israel. Uh, immediately after his resurrection, in fact, there's frequent reference to the body of Christ being the called a temple. And the body of Christ meaning the church. Uh, here, Israel is represented as the stones of the temple. And so by taking in that, that temple and, and destroying it and scattering it, it's a metaphor, of course, for Israel being scattered. Now, Israel's primarily already been scattered a couple of times. So this is really a spiritual scattering. Um, scattering happens spiritually first. Scattering happens because of sin. Gathering happens spiritually first, and it happens because of repentance and joining the covenant, right? And so here the Savior says this, this, this scattering, this spiritual scattering, this apostasy will certainly unfold, and it'll as, as be as scattered as the stones of this temple, and not one shall remain upon the other. Uh, and then he talks about, uh, well, well, we'll see here, he says in verse 12, well, let's actually do a little bit more here. He says, many false Christs were come in 6 and 7, and false prophets in verse 9. This is all even in the times of the apostles. And the, because of iniquity, the love of many shall wax cold, verse 10. Verse 12. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, then you shall stand in the holy place, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Now you have this phrase, abomination of desolation. And this is a phrase that was introduced to our lexicon by Daniel. Uh, and it had reference to uh, uh, a Syrian king capturing you know, the, 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 the Israelites. This was about you know, 200 B.C., 170 B.C. And there was such destruction that abomination was the name of that desolation, that destruction. That same title, if you will, is what the Savior was saying would, would be the state of Israel and Jerusalem in 70 AD, that this same abomination of desolation would occur. And then, in parallelism, 
He applies that now again to how it will be prior to his second coming. And we'll see this phrase in DNC 88 and other places where this abomination of desolation is prophesied must occur prior to the Lord's second coming. Um, well, let's skip over. I want to get down to uh, less about the temple being scattered in that day and talk more about our day. And you can see here in verse 21 where this transition happens in his explanation uh, of answering those two questions that the apostles asked. Verse 21. Behold, these things I have spoken to you concerning the Jews. That's 70 A.D. All right? And again. You're going to see that phrase many times here. And again. And we're emphasizing that there are types and shadows. There are parallel principles. There are things that happened in the past that will happen in the future. And the past, perhaps, metaphorically speaking, is the best indicator of what will happen in the future. Right? And so, and again, after the tribulation of those days, which shall come upon Jerusalem, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe him not. Here's a comforting phrase. For in those days there shall also arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if possible, they would deceive the very elect, who are the elect according to the covenant. Behold, however... I speak these things unto you for who? For the elect's sake. That's why the Lord revealed these things. He revealed the signs of the times, not for the wicked, but for the righteous. Uh, and that harkens back to what we read in the 106th section. That those who are the children of light would not be overtaken as the thief in the night. Well, there shall in that day be Wars and rumors of wars. In verse 23, there also will be many who say, you know, Christ is coming from here in this and that direction and so on and so forth. Verse 26, for as the light of the morning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west and covereth the whole earth, so shall the, also be the coming of the Son of Man. All right? It's not going to be a private affair. It's going to be a very, very public affair. Everyone's going to know it. Just as the sun rises in the east, we all see it and we can feel it and we acknowledge it. It, it goes hand in glove with the concept of every knee you know, must bow and every tongue confess because it's just that plain obvious. Um, well, there have to be a couple of things that happen before he comes as the light from the east. Verse 27, the Lord says himself, And now I show unto you a parable. Behold, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. For so likewise shall mine elect be gathered from the four quarters of the earth. Now you have a little bit of a strange uh, metaphor here, symbol. The carcass. And when the, when the carcass of the animal is out in the wilderness, uh, what happens? Well, the vultures start coming. The predators start coming. Now, I don't want you to be offended when, when I tell you that uh, the carcass is the church. All right? And Israel are the eagles. So here's the carcass, which equals the church. And it's in the wilderness. And all these eagles are flying around. And when they see the carcass, they will begin to gather in from their disparate locations to be part of the church. What he's saying is that before I come again, my kingdom will be established and I will begin to once again gather in Israel. We could, we won't, belabor the point that the greatest sign of the times is the restoration of the gospel. The greatest sign that the Lord is about to come again is that the gospel has in its fullness been restored. Um, well, he says that that must happen. That's one thing. The gathering will happen, uh, and they will flock to the carcass, to the church, and they shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, as we've said, 
Behold, I speak again for mine elect's sake, reemphasizing that point. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. Now you'll see the next three verses. How does each verse begin? And again, and again, and again. This is the doctrine of Samo Samo. Seen it before, you're going to see it again. Right? Yeah, Linda. I'm saying the church, and I'm saying don't be offended by a, a cruel metaphor. Uh, it, w- it wasn't cruel in their day. It was just simply that there's, there's something that attracts the gathering. It's not that the church is corroded. or it, It's the Latter-day Church. It's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. All right? But it was dead. When the church, <laughs> when the church is established, the eagles will flock to it. That's the point. And so this is just a metaphor that Christ is saying that we're going to gather in. It has nothing to do with the church being dead. It, it, the church is living and has revelation. All right. Now, iniquity shall abound and the love of men shall wax cold. That's a description of the day that we live in, right? Um, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, verse 31, in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come, or the destruction of the wicked. And again shall the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, be fulfilled. So what do we have here? We're saying that prior to the Lord coming, number one, the gospel is restored. Israel begins to gather... And this happens in every land. And this is really the greatest of all the signs of the times. Um, Now we get into some of the events that will transpire prior to his second coming. And I think we might move over here from... From, well, let's read it quickly here, and then we'll go to DNC 45. And immediately after the tribulation of those days, so this abomination of desolation, this destruction that is yet future, spoken of by Daniel, then the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Verily I say unto you, this generation in which these things shall be shown shall not pass away uh, all until all that I have told you shall be fulfilled. Although the days will come that heaven and earth shall pass away. Now, when Joseph Smith was, um, uh, well, in 1831, right after the church had been organized, Joseph Smith uh, received a revelation that we now call section 45, the Doctrine and Covenants. The day after he got that revelation, he began working on the translation of the New Testament. Uh, Because of what the Lord, in essence, repeated to the prophet Joseph Smith, there, he, he, he he had already received the invitation, but he immediately went to translating the the New Testament. Um, But let's go to section 45, because it speaks of these signs of the times. And uh, this this language here uh, really begins in verse 16. And it goes through, goodness, really, almost the end of the the chapter. I think there's a few things that we could maybe pick up here. Uh, Beginning halfway through 16, this is the Lord speaking of his sermon that he gave to the apostles that we have in Joseph Smith Matthew. Repeating that, he says, As ye have asked of me concerning the signs of my coming, in the day that I shall come in my glory in the clouds of heaven, to fulfill the promise that I have made to your fathers, then certain things will happen. You can see in uh, verse 20, he has that temple imagery. 
In verse 22, or 21, he talks about the desolation again that we've spoken of. And, um, and then you get into this concept. Let's, let's, let's pick this up here in verse 23. And in this ye shall say truly, for so it is, but these things which I have told you shall not pass away until all shall be fulfilled. And this I have told you concerning Jerusalem. And when that day shall come, shall a remnant be scattered among all nations. Now he's speaking of Jerusalem. He's speaking of the Jews. He's speaking of... Uh, you could say the house of Israel, but he's really talking about the Jewish nation. He's saying that they would be scattered everywhere, but that there would be remnants of the Jews scattered throughout the nations. Maybe a little bit in Russia, maybe a little bit in Germany, maybe a little bit in Bulgaria and Romania. But they're scattered, and there's a remnant of them among all nations. In Argentina. In Argentina. Okay. And I've got an Argentinian expert here saying that they're in Argentina. But they shall be gathered again, and they shall remain until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now we have this interesting phrase. We have this interesting phrase that uh, you'll see consistently through various revelations about the times of the Gentiles. And the question is, brothers and sisters, what does that phrase mean? What does the phrase mean, the times of the Gentiles? What period is this? Yeah. Yeah, the question is, are, are we considered uh, Gentiles prior to being baptized? Yes. And, in a manner of speaking, in the language of the Book of Mormon, you're still a Gentile because you're not from Judah and Jerusalem. So we speak about this in terms of a spiritual lineage and we speak about this as a nationalistic issue. And we've got to, you know, depending on the context of the passage, be able to decipher which one he's speaking of. But you have this term that there is a period of time called the times of the Gentiles. That time began immediately after Christ's death. You'll recognize from Acts chapter 10 uh, the story of Peter and Cornelius, remember? And how the Lord now says, Peter, take the gospel to all the nations of the Gentiles. And that was, that was in effect saying, we're not going to focus our prophylating effort simply on the house of Israel. We're going to take it to the nations of the world. Prior to that, that was not the case. You remember the woman who says, hey, just because I'm a Gentile, can't I have the gospel, Lord? And what does the Lord say? You know, we do not give that which is meat for dogs. And you read that and you think that's harsh language. And again, we have some cultural uh, misunderstanding there. But, but he was basically saying, that the gospel went forth on a priority basis. And at one point in time, it was just to the house of Israel. But after he departed, Peter, the president of the church, is commanded, given that beautiful vision of the sheet that comes down from heaven and it's opened up and there's all sorts of animals in there. Those of a clean and an unclean hoof, right? And it's he's saying, you take the gospel to the world. And this is the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. Yes, Bill? You are, Bill, you are an Israelite and a Gentile. That's what I said, yeah. You are an Israelite. You are an Israelite in the fact that you have Abraham as your grandfather. 
And this is Abraham 2 that talks about the literal seed of Abraham are those who are gathered in and we carry the message to the end of the earth. So that, that is correct. And you are a Gentile because you belong to the Gentile nations of the world from Judah's perspective. You're not part of the nation of Israel. You're part of the house and the lineage and the spiritual house of Israel, but you're not part, you, weren't, you, you don't have a passport that says Jerusalem. And, that, and that's what Nephi is, is really, that's what I'm saying. So when we talk about the times of the Gentiles, we were talking about the times from Acts chapter 10 when the Lord said, you take the gospel, you know, not only to the Jews, but you take it to everybody. And we're still in the time of the Gentiles now. We're still where the gospel is being preached in all the nations of the world. Um, Joseph Fielding Smith talks about this. Yes, yes. It's the first shall be last and the last shall be first. The gospel was taken first to the Jews and they will be the last to receive it prior to the Lord coming. He'll literally put his foot on the Mount of Olives and then they will begin to accept. All right? Uh, and I'll, you could say Ephraim or even the Gentiles. Uh, got, the, the Gentile nations got it second. But it came to America, it was restored here, and then England, and then South America, and all right. So the first is last, and the last was first to receive it in these days. Here's, um, when we talk about uh, these times of the Gentiles, When is that time up? Well, it's when once again the gospel is being taken deliberately to the Jews and they're receiving it in great order, uh, in great numbers. George Q. Morris, the Quorum of the Twelve, said, I think perhaps we may well now continue saying that the Jews are going to gather together to Jerusalem. I think now we might say that they have gathered the ultimate return will come later as they develop this land and are joined by others. What he was saying is that the nation of Israel was once again being brought together. And you, you probably know that history, but in, you know, the nation of Israel really, at the invitation of the British in the early 1900s, begin, the, the, the Jews begin coming back to the land of Israel. Uh, that's a precursor to the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled. Um, the Gentiles will, for the most part, reject the gospel. President Joseph Fielding Smith wrote, And when the times of the Gentiles has come in, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel. The Lord said in that revelation, the meaning of this is that when the time had come for the restoration of the gospel in the times of the Gentiles, that it would be not perceived because of the hardness of people's hearts. They would be turned away, and they would turn away from the gospel. However, in that generation, this should happen. The times of the Gentiles should be fulfilled. Let's, let's pick that up here in chapter 40, section 45. We'll read a little, more, a little bit more carefully. In this last days, there will be wars and rumors of wars, as we've mentioned. Verse 27, the love of men shall wax cold, and iniquity shall abound. And when the times of the Gentiles has come in, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel. So what's the sign that we're in the times of the Gentiles in these last days? That there's a light that breaks forth. So what's that light? The gospel. The restoration. That happens. But does that mean that it will be uniformly... Accepted and received? Verse 29. But they, meaning the Gentiles, receive it not. For they perceive not the light. And they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men. And in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So... The gospel light breaks forth. 
Some of those eagles gather to the carcass, come to the church. But by and large, because of the precepts of men, there are many, many, many of the Gentiles who do not accept the light that breaks forth, right? Well, we live in that day. Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, has about 16 and a half million people. I think it's two-tenths of one percent of the Earth's population. There's a great deal of work left to be done, quite clearly. This was foreseen by Nephi. You'll see this in uh, 2 Nephi 14. Yes. Uh, Maureen asks, is it true that there are a lot of the members of the church who are falling away now? Uh, and yes, that is true. Uh, it's not just Latter-day Saints. There's been a great secularization that's happening in America and in Western culture at large. Uh, in fact, one of three Protestants in the last 20 years has left their faith. So, you know, that's uh, seven million Protestants uh, in, the, in the three major Protestant denominations. Uh, that's a tremendous fall off. We just had a very interesting fireside there night in the second ward where Josh Coates, who founded the B.H. Roberts Foundation, is doing a lot of research on this and had a lot of statistical data that I found very, very interesting. Um, but this is something that we're struggling with uh, in Christianity and in religion at large. Um, so the answer to your question is, uh, we are still growing as a church, which is actually pretty phenomenal given what I just told you about the Protestant denomination, isn't it? You know, in the last 10, 10 plus years, we added 600,000 members in the United States, where the same you know, time period you saw a dramatic decrease among some of the, uh, some of the other evangelical and, and Protestant denominations. Uh, that in and of itself, I think, is a miracle. But times are challenging. It's exactly what the Lord's talking about. Because of the precepts of men, because of the precepts of men, you will see many who fall away. Um, well... Oh, I was going to go to second, or 1 Nephi 14. And this is just a great verse to keep in mind. Um, 1 Nephi, this is uh, Nephi who's seeing a remarkable vision. This is, remember, he had seen the pilgrims, and he saw the revolutionary soldiers, and he saw the establishment of America, and he saw the Book of Mormon coming forth, and Joseph Smith, and so on and so forth. Then he says in verse 12, And it came to pass that I beheld the church of the Lamb of God. Yeah, 1 Nephi 14, verse 12. And its numbers were few. Why? Because of the wickedness and the abominations of the whore who sat upon many waters. Nevertheless, I beheld that the church of the Lamb who were the saints of God, were also upon all the face of the earth. And their dominions, what would their dominions be, brothers and sisters? Their wards and their branches, their churches and their temples, their boundaries of stewardship. Their dominions were upon the face of the earth and their dominions upon the face of the earth were small because of the wickedness of the great horror whom I saw. All right. So that's where we are. Now there'll come a day where that changes dramatically, but that's going to be millennial. That'll be millennial. Um, when you see now that the majority of nations and cities gather to the covenant um, well, let's, um, we were back in section 45. One of the things that ought to comfort us is even though that there will be scourges and desolating sicknesses and wars and rumors of wars, it says, but my disciples shall stand in holy places and shall not be moved. What do you think that means, brothers and sisters? In the midst of all that turmoil, my covenant people will stand in holy places and shall not be moved. Well, the temple is certainly a place of solace. There's protection in the covenants of the house of the Lord. Yeah, Glenn? The home. 
Absolutely, the home will be a refuge. It'll be a refuge to the spiritual and the temporal um, warfare that's all around us. That's right. If you couldn't hear, the comment was that, hey, the church is here to support the home and the family, not the other way around. Really, the church is the scaffolding. Right? Yeah, Linda? Yes. That's a great point. You know, all carnage could be breaking loose on every side and you could be at peace. You know? It's interesting. I was in lower Manhattan on 9-11. I worked on Wall Street when the um, when the Twin Towers came tumbling down and I saw the smoke and the fire and uh, Witnessed all of that, and I, it's a long story, I won't take time to tell, but I ran up to our bishop's home in Midtown Manhattan, Joan, your son-in-law, Dave Buckner, and, um, and Dave asked me how I could be, and I just felt peace. We were doing a calling tree to call everybody in the elders quorum and the Relief Society and the ward and making sure everyone was okay, and, and Bishop Buckner asked me how I could feel so much peace, and I did. I felt peace in the midst of this great calamity. I think it has something to do with we can stand in holy places. You can have perspective and peace in the midst of great turmoil around us because you know uh, that the Lord's in charge. And he'll protect you. He'll guide you. He'll comfort you. He'll, uh, he will vanquish every foe, right? Well, section 45... Um, is one of those sections that, that uh, talk about some of these signs of the times. But let's change gears. Let's change dispensations. And let's go to one concept here. And I've got this one in your notes. The question always is, well, when's the Lord going to come? Are we there? Are we, is this, is this going to happen in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Of course, the answer is, I have no idea. But the Lord gives us these signs to read the tea leaves. Um, and in fact, he does that very deliberately. You think about the metaphors that he uses when he teaches about the signs of the second coming. One is a fig tree with leaves indicating that fruit is about to come. There's an indication of what's going to happen. Another one is a woman in travail. So she might, you might not know the minute she's going to give birth, but you know, we're getting close, right? Uh, well, I'm going to take you in just in one minute, Ophelia. Another one is the Son of Man who comes as the rising of the sun in the east. And then another one is the thief that comes in the night. But many of those metaphors, he's saying there are preparatory indications uh, that you'll be able to tell. So, Ophelia, where I was going is this page, uh, that one. Uh, I, I don't think I marked these. I'm sorry, brothers and sisters. But I, it's got the blue arrows on it if you want to go there. Um, as I said earlier, the Lord frequently says the greatest sign that we're in the last days, the greatest sign of the times is that the gospel has been restored and that Israel is being gathered in. But there's some nuance to how that process must ultimately happen prior to the Lord coming again. And I've outlined here for you in my estimation what some of those, if you're going to look at a filter of the way that the gospel has to be uh, preached must happen prior to the Lord coming again, all right? D and C, well, Revelation 14 says that, hey, the restored gospel will go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So we know that the gospel has got to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Well, now let's narrow the filter a little bit. DNC 90 says that every man will hear the gospel in his own tongue. So we go to every nation and they hear it in their own tongue. And so we send missionaries down to the MTC and we teach them things like Swahili, Swahili and Mandarin Chinese. 
All right? And that's all well and good. And we send them across the world to teach them in a tongue that they can understand natively to themselves. Well, we haven't taught the gospel in every language. Haven't taught them, in, you know, every man in his own tongue. But let's take that filter one more level. Alma 29. The Lord doth grant unto all nations of their own nation and tongue to teach his word. What's the difference? What's the distinction there? They are being taught of their own nation. That's right. That's right. That's why the Filipinos go to the Philippines and the Taiwanese go to Taiwan. And I just told you about the missionaries from the Wasatch Front going to the MTC so they could go to Africa and teach in Swahili. But I think there's a little bit more uh, nuance here that would suggest that people must hear the gospel in their own tongue of people from their own nation. Now, part of that may be that you send a missionary there and they baptize a young man who's now in his you know, young 30s and he's called as the stake president or the mission president after being in the church for two years. And you have this beautiful African or South American who's got three years in the church and he's now, uh, and he and his wife are leading and teaching and okay, well, that, that certainly applies. We read 1 Nephi 14, 12 that said the saints on the earth would be few but they would be upon all the face of the earth and they would have dominions. So you would expect to see temples cropping up all over the land and that hasn't happened yet. Oh, wait. <laughs> I forgot. Uh, we've got about 300, I think, that have been announced uh, or built. And President Nelson has done well over 100 in his short four years of, uh, of his ministry announced. And you got them in places like Shanghai being developed, and you've got them in places like India and the Middle East, Abu Dhabi, isn't it? Dubai. Yeah, Dubai. Um, just remarkable what's happening so that the Lord's dominions will be across the face of the earth. And now, what this really means is that people in every land will have access to the covenants. Not that there's a temple in every city, but that they can go, and that they can make it there. President Nelson keeps saying, we're going to take the temples to the people. We're not going to bring the people to the temple. We're going to take the temples to the people. And so we're going to modify the way they're constructed. And we're not going to do 50,000 square foot, you know, uh, really expensive. We're going to do a six to 9,000 square foot model that are modularly constructed and they can be transported where there's no, you know, in, in whole or in part, uh, where there's components because you, they may not have a manufacturing force or the raw materials in Central America where this needs to go. And so the, the Lord is resting upon the prophet and he's leading the effort to take these covenants and these dominions to the ends of the earth. Yes? If you couldn't hear the comment, it was that there's a YouTube video, which no, I have not seen, but it shows a timeline of the temples being developed over the last 175 years, and then how that effectively just kind of explodes in the last 20 years, right? And we'll continue. Uh, I went down to BYU, had a real, I'm in real estate, we had a real estate conference there about a month ago, and um, we had um, the member of the 70 who was on the temple committee that was really uh, involved in so much of the temple coordination uh, in the 2000s, uh, and, and he, well, no, more recently, because he said he was in a meeting with uh, President Nelson where they were speaking of, I think it was either 24 or 42 new temples under construction, and President Nelson said, a little under his breath, but that the brethren could hear, he says, we need to add a, a zero to that number. Um, <laughs> You get the point. Um, well, now let's go to something else. This, this I, let's repeat what we've said. The gospel will go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Everyone will hear the gospel in their own tongue. And they will hear it from people from their own nation. Right? And their dominions will be ubiquitously available throughout the world. Prior to the Lord coming again. 
Now I'm going to take you here, I'm going to stop there and, and transfer over to the Apocalypse of John. Go to the book of Revelation. And let's read about some of the signs of the times here. Uh, we'll begin in Revelation chapter 6. And you'll recall in this chapter that John is seeing a book that is sealed with seven seals. And each one of those seals is uh, representative of a thousand years of the earth's temporal history. Uh, and he rehearses what will happen in those thousand year periods, right? And each of them is identified as a seal. And then we get to the sixth seal, which is the day that we live in. The events of the seventh seal are what primarily occupy the remainder of the book of, of Revelation. Most of it is millennial. But we can identify in these chapters a few of the items that must, according to John, occur prior to the Lord's second coming. And they're here uh, in Revelation 6 and 7. We begin in verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Now that same thing is rehearsed to the prophet Joseph Smith in several places in the Doctrine and Covenants. And the, earth, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as the fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. Well, Victor Ludlow talks about three great things that happened in the sixth seal, one of them being a great earthquake. Um... There are those who think, well, gosh, we had a big earthquake in the 1800s in China. I think what John was seeing was much larger than that. Uh, I think that, my, this is my opinion, this is yet future. Uh, and that there will be, it, it will be so dramatic uh, that the kings of the earth, the rich men and the great men, will hide themselves in the rocks of the mountains. Okay. You go into chapter 7. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. And the wind should not blow upon the earth, nor the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending out of the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, don't hurt it yet. Don't you go down and destroy the earth yet. Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. This must happen in the sixth seal. The way this works is the seventh seal is opened, and after the seventh seal is opened, the Lord comes in his glory. All right? So we've still got to do a lot of work before the seventh seal is opened. And one of those things is that the servants of God will be sealed in their foreheads, and you and I need to explore what that means. What you'll see in the next several verses is effectively John saying that, that you would have uh, this, these, the servants of God sealed, uh, and he says there would be 12,000 of every tribe. And so you get the, this is where you get, that 144,000 is 12 times 12. Well, the whole book of John is done in a metaphorical sense, and many of the numbers are not intended to be literal, but they are to imply certain things. First of all, what is 12? 12. 12 is a number that is the, a number of the house of Israel. It's a number of testament, testimony, all right? 
And to emphasize the importance of this, we're going to square it. And then to further dramatize it, we're going to multiply it by a thousand. And John is saying there will be witnesses, there will be covenant keepers in every tribe. And they collectively will be this 144,000. Now whether that means there's exactly 12,000 from Gad and from Asher and Naphtali and Zebulon, no, that's, I don't think that's the point. The point is that there's, there are great hosts of testimony-filled, covenant-keeping uh, kings and priests who are sealed on their forehead. And, and, and what does that mean? Let's, let's go to the commentary on that in section 77 of the Doctrine and Covenants where the brethren were sitting around asking Joseph what these verses meant. And he got very deliberate with them, very uh, specific. D and C 77, beginning here in verse 11. What are we to understand, Brother Joseph? By sealing the 100 and... 44,000 out of all the tribes of Israel, 12,000 out of every tribe? Answer. We are to understand that those who are sealed are high priests, ordained under the holy order of God to administer the everlasting gospel. For they are they who are ordained out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people by the angels to whom it is given power over the nations to bring of the earth to bring as many as will come to the church of the firstborn. What's Joseph's answer? Who are these 144,000 brothers and sisters? They are high priests. They're high priests. Obviously, this includes their wives. And they go forth, they are, are, are ordained after the holy order of the Son of God, the Melchizedek priesthood, to do what? To administer the gospel. Well, how do you administer the gospel? Well, you do that by missionary work, but you certainly do that by other means. You do that by literally bringing a brother or a sister into the walls of the temple and performing on, you know, for them the ordinances of the covenant. Um, let's find, it's not in your notes, I have a few secret notes. <laughs> um, Joseph Smith said this, four destroying angels holding power over the four quarters of the earth until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads, which signifies sealing the blessing upon their heads meaning the everlasting covenant, thereby making their calling and election sure. All right? Well, that's pretty... That's the, the reference is the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 321. So Joseph Smith takes that 104, 144 to mean, literally, the people who have received, you know, their temple covenants and ultimately have calling and election made sure. And then if you marry this quote with what we just read in section 77, they are to administer the gospel. So what are we saying here, brothers and sisters? Well, I don't know that you have to have 12,000 of every tribe, but you've got to have some. And they've got to be a, a number here. Uh, throughout all the nations of the earth. Throughout all the nations of the earth. And... Uh, they come forth out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And they're administering from those nations, is what the Revelation says. So yes, there have been many who have gone on to the spirit world. But I think we're talking about those who come out of the nations. And that's work that's yet ahead. We've still got a lot of gathering to do, don't we? Um, well, Bruce R. McConkie says... John here sees 144 of these kings and priests, 12,000 from each tribe, converted, baptized, endowed, married for eternity, and finally sealed up unto eternal life, having their calling and election made sure. 
Well, that, according to John, happens in the sixth seal. That happens before the second coming. There's another point here that we could just dramatize. Back in, let's, let's leave that point for a moment and come back to chapter 7 of, of Revelation. And you see here that it says in verse 2, he sees another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God, meaning that it's that authority to bind on earth and loose. That's the sealing power that ratifies ordinances or that uh, seals ordinances, I should say. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt. And he says, don't you do that. Don't you hurt the earth yet. Don't destroy the earth yet. We've got work to do. We've got to, we've got to gather Israel. Well, who is that angel? And now let's go back to D&C 77. And there's the question. We want, you can, you, it's verse 9. There's a question and an answer. And about half, if you turn the page halfway down, Joseph Smith answers... He says, if you will receive it, who is this? This is Elias, which was come to gather together the tribes of Israel and restore all things. So who is this angel that we speak of in Revelation chapter 7? It's Elias. And who is Elias? Who is Elias, brothers and sisters? It's a composite Elias. It's many Eliases. There wasn't one Elias who came and brought what was necessary. You have in the Revelations, the term Elias specifically refers to John the Baptist. It specifically refers to John the Revelator. In another place, in D&C 27, it specifically refers to Noah. In D&C 110, which is the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, it specifically refers to someone we specifically don't know who it is, okay? The, the spirit and power of Elias, and there's someone from the dispensation of Abraham. It's all of these Eliases, all of these angels, all of these prophetic ministers who come, and they bring what they need to bring prior to the Lord saying to the four angels, now you go ahead and begin the work of destruction and allow the upheaval uh, that will be a preamble to my second coming, okay? Well, many of those have come. Many of those have come. Um, well, what else do we say, brothers and sisters? Let's maybe, maybe summarize what we have said. What's the greatest evidence that we are in the latter days and that the signs of the times have commenced? Gospel's been restored. Gospel's been restored. The fullness of the gospel. A light that breaks forth among the Gentiles. And again, and, and Bill, if we were to read 3 Nephi 15, 16, you'll see that the Gentile nations are the na uh, refer to America, actually, in that context. So it comes George Washington and Abe Lincoln and everything else, right? And the, the, the gospel is restored in this land. And yet, even though it's restored, many will not accept it because why? Because of the precepts of men. And the condition of the hearts and the minds of men, because they are influenced by the world, iniquity abounds and their love waxes cold. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Uh, I, based on what we've talked about these last several weeks, I think we could say that we're seeing that. I think you'll see that in greater proportion in the future. Uh, in fact, what's, uh, there, uh, an interesting phrase came to my mind from Alma that talks about, um, it says, you'll, you'll remember the phrase, I believe he's speaking to his son Corianton, where he says, bridle your passions, that ye may be filled with love. There's a part of being filled with love that is requiring constraint and fidelity, integrity, Right? Well, when those constraints are gone, you know, iniquity abounds and hearts wax cold. Uh, so that, that surely will happen. The times of the Gentiles, which we're still in, 
will be fulfilled. And there will come a time at the very end when the gospel goes forth and the Jews will receive. Christ will put his foot on the Mount of Olives. You know, I had a remarkable experience. I lived in Manhattan for six years. And there's a lot of Jewish people in Manhattan. And frankly, I love the Jewish people uh, from my experience working with them. I grew up, my best friend growing up was a young man named Colin Sutz. And he was a Jewish guy. And he, you know, I'm as tall as I am and he's as short as he was. And we were like the best of friends. Um, And anyway, I was going to the store one evening when I was single, living in Manhattan. I lived on the Upper West Side, just below Columbia University, on 121st and Broadway in Columbus, that area. And I went to the corner store. And as I walked to the store, there was about, oh, a dozen or so young Jewish people. I knew they were Jewish. They were dressed for the Sabbath. And they walked right by me, and they had a lot of, oh, just great atmosphere among them in their speech and something happened i walked by them and they were talking and i just stopped and they just kept walking and i just felt compelled to turn around and just look at them and i just felt this connection to them uh well scriptures talk about the enmity between ephraim and judah ceasing in the last days i'm of ephraim and uh There's a special kinship, I think, opportunity and and even blessing that lies ahead uh, between Ephraim and and Judah. Uh, Well, that day will come, but I believe largely is yet future, right? One of the things we didn't mention today is that there will be many occurrences where the Lord comes again before he comes in glory. Maybe next week we'll have time to talk a little bit about the establishment of the New Jerusalem and the temple in Jackson County and, and as part of the prophecies that, of things that must be completed prior to the Lord's advent. Yeah? Deuteronomy 13 talks about the sons of Levi offering an offering unto the Lord again. Do you think that's literal or do you think that's just going to the temple? And... So Dan's asking D&C 13, which is the restoration of the Aaronic priesthoods, John the Baptist, it's one verse, the whole chapter section. And it, and it says that the day will come when the sons of Levi do offer again an offering in righteousness to the Lord. Uh, that's literal. Uh, in fact, Joseph Smith says that you thought that all blood sacrifice was done away with. He says there will yet again be blood sacrifice so that the sons of Levi can offer an offering in righteousness in the last days. So there are, there are still a great many things to do. Now, what is, where does that leave us, brothers and sisters? Uh, yes, we are in the Saturday of time. Uh, yes, we are seeing many of the things fulfilled that the Lord has prophesied. Nephi told us in 2 Nephi 25 how to understand Isaiah, and he said one of the things you understand is that you live in the day of fulfillment of those prophecies. You and I can read this, and we go, oh yeah, I recognize that. We're living in the day of many of the fulfillment of these prophecies. And yet, I believe there's still a little bit of work to do. I think we've got to have those high priests from every nation speaking in their own tongue, administering the gospel. We've got to have a temple president in the Middle East speaking Farsi and administering ordinances to his people. We've got to have that. We've got to have that all over the world. And we're getting there. The question is, how quickly can that happen? I do not know. But when the Lord hastens his work, I wouldn't put anything past him, right? Um, Well, let me revert in closing to uh, that section D and C 106, where the Lord says that... uh, Verse 3, speaking of war and cowardry, but having an application to you and I, we ought to devote our whole time to this high and holy calling, being members of this church, which I now give unto him, seeking diligently that the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness and all things necessary shall be added unto 
thereunto. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. And again, verily I say unto you, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and it overtaketh the world as a thief in the night. So what do we do? We gird up our loins. We get ready. We prepare ourselves. We lay up in store. We fill our lamps so that they're not empty when the bridegroom comes. We dress ourselves appropriately, as was taught in conference, so at the wedding feast, we feel comfortable in the company of the wedding party. Beautiful temple symbolism. We wear the robes of righteousness. We qualify ourselves for the covenants. We stay securely on the path. We do all that we can to love and encourage and sponsor others along that path. And yet when we don't have every desire of our heart, as we talked about a few weeks ago, we put it in the Lord's hand and we put trust that he'll continue to gather. And when he comes down, like in Jacob 5, and works alongside the servants of the vineyard, there will be a great harvest with his compassion and his love and his mercy, his capability to harvest in Israel. Well, what do we do? You gird up your loins that you may be the children of light. And that day shall not overtake you as a thief. That's the promise and the blessing of the Lord. You will not be left in the darkness and have a thief overcome and overtake you. You'll be protected by the master of the house who ought to be and is the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, thanks for being here today. Next week, we will focus uh, on the millennium and the second coming. And maybe that's a lot for one hour, but uh, we'll see what we do. Brothers and sisters, I have every confidence that the gospel has been restored. I have every confidence that Joseph Smith saw what he said he saw, and that every right, privilege, and power that uh, he spoke of has in fact been restored, and that today we operate under a system of authority where the Lord is, has his approbation upon this kingdom. And I have every confidence that uh, the Lord will support this kingdom as we go forth to continue to gather in and to take this gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Uh, I have every hope in that, and I know that it's true, and I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.